Hi Booktube and welcome to a new video. This is a recent read and what a very good reading period it's been. Uh, five books, none less than four stars. So The Night Alphabet by Joel Taylor. A book by an Armenian author. A book untitled by Shushan Avagyan and translated by Diana Kachouan Chance. Headshot by Rita Borwinkel. The Plotinus or the Plotinus by Ricky de Cornet. And finally, Long Way Down by Jason Reynolds. So I'm going to start with Joel Taylor, which is as close as you can get to a perfect novel, I feel. Joel Taylor is primarily a poet, this is her debut novel, and it's very much a strength of the book. She's such a lyrical writer, it's just festooned with gorgeous images, such as... I blew smoke across the photograph of King Crow. Who's this dead man, then? Birdie took the split from my mouth, as though it were a thermometer. He's Jess Lawson's youngest. You know her, don't you? She, tro she, she elbowed Tanya in the side, causing her pen to skid off the page. Then a bit later, in the same meeting... Smoke was building up in the cabin as we toyed with the information, the spliff passing resolutely between us like a talking stick. So I love the images of taking a spliff from someone else, like removing a thermometer that you're taking the temperature of a child. Or here, the spliff is a talking stick. It gives the person with the spliff permission to, to, to speak. It's wonderfully lyrical, as I say. There's just loads of gorgeous images like that. So what's it about? So if you're familiar with Ray Bradbury's um, The Illustrated Man, which I only know from the film, I've never read the book, there a man is uh, tattooed head to foot and each tattoo bears a story. This is doing something similar, although it's very much um, uh, sort of engendered for the female because an old woman comes into this tattoo parlour, she's covered head to toe in tattoos, but she's asking uh, the tattooist and her young assistant to join them up, to link them all. Because these stories tell stories, but they're not able to solve for her. Although she can remember the individual story, she's not able to put it all into a whole. And she thinks that by linking them, that will be the key to unlock, basically, the history of her life. And uh, her life is one of similar to uh, The Bone Clocks by David Mitchell, although far, far superior for a reason I'll go on to, um, this woman has the ability to jump into the bodies of others and to sort of become live their lives for the period that she's in them, as do her mother and her grandmother. They all have this ability, but when they do it, they lose contact with who they really are back, you know, from the time and the place that they've come from. Um, and these stories are all mnemonics to remember, you know, uh, what what uh, what what places and time she's been in. So it's a bit like sort of time travel in a way. The difference between this and David Mitchell's is that it's a sort of uh, supernatural or whatever trope, which I wasn't prepared to put up with in David Mitchell's because I couldn't see what the point of it was other than David Mitchell's love of this world building that he's created, which I wasn't interested in. Here, each story is fundamentally rooted in, in the real, in, in not necessarily just in the now. For example, there's a story that takes place in a sort of Victorian England where there's been a coal mining disaster, a lot of the miners have been killed, and this family are now impoverished because they've lost their only uh, income. And the 14-year-old daughter uh, takes her, f her dead father's clothes and puts them on, and she can sort of pass the mail uh, because only men are allowed down the pits. And so she replaces her father by going down and, and making money for, for the family. And there's this whole thing about do they really know that that she's a she's a girl but they sort of turn a blind eye because they know her situation and the more modern things are so there's a story about human trafficking there's a story uh about um a brothel on on a housing estate behind king's cross station and it has the sort of two pimps who run the business notionally they're there to protect the girls but the girls are being harassed by the sort of the next generation of, of would-be criminals, and they keep demanding protection from 
from the pimps who aren't doing anything about it. And indeed, that uh, section I read about the Council of War comes from this story as they decide how they're going to, you know, wrest power back from these boys. Uh, there's a story which very much is in tune with um, her poetry collection Canto, which I, I read, which is very much there about um, lesbian bars that used to sort of exist in, in London but no longer exist. Here it's fleshed out brilliantly, whereby uh, there's a lesbian bar which no longer exists but is populated by the ghosts of the lesbians uh, who, who uh, frequented it and why they are all become ghosts. And again, they're under siege from uh, male drinkers who come in, you know, it's a pub, they just want to drink. They don't realise that it's a sacred space for, for lesbians. So again, they're sort of besieged. There's lots of stories of besieging. There's lots of stories of uh, containing these triptychs representing, you know, the original uh, grandmother, mother and, and daughter who is the narrator here. Um, and it's just beautifully done. I won't spoil the ending. I did see the ending coming, I have to say, but even that didn't spoil my my enjoyment of this. It's it's a par exemplar um, of storytelling, of sort of social analysis, but not in a you know it's too it's too lyrical to be sort of dry and academic. It's just beautifully done, and it is about women under siege. Sometimes they're able to fight off their besiegers, sometimes they're not. The human trafficking story, for example. They have they maintain a thin line. The night alphabet of the title of the book, they maintain this thin line of being able to communicate with, with other trafficked uh, sex workers, but they're unable to liberate themselves. But at least they can talk to each other and share experiences and, and sort of reclaim some power just by being a collective. So I just thought this was beautiful and... Uh, very incisively written, uh, five stars. And on to uh, this book, a book untitled. So it is a book without a title. It's a book without an ending. It's a book that offers four different openings. Um, it's very much an example, I feel, of Roland Barthes' The Death of the Author. He says the author, once the book is published, is no longer in control of the work and how it will be interpreted. And therefore, it's the reader who is really making the work, almost writing the work. And in a way, this book is very much challenging the reader, provoking the reader to decide, you know, what it is doing. Uh, in addition to the sort of uh, lack of title and uh, lack of ending, it queries the nature of translation. You know, is translation to be, uh, you know, to reflect the idiom and the value system and the understanding of uh, English speakers, in this case, because it's obviously an English translation, you know, which he calls the lingua franca of the world, uh, in which case a lot of the Armenian stuff would sort of disappear and be colonised out of existence. Or does it preserve its alienness, its foreignness, by not kowtowing to, um, to sort of the needs of English? And this sort of whole thing, this whole battle between colonialism and power and interpretation. Um, it's about four women from two different time periods. Two of them are Armenian uh, women writers who've completely disappeared from the canon, mainly under the um, administrations of the Soviets when Armenia was part of the Soviet Union. Uh, that, uh, as with all writers that, you know, Stalin eventually deemed them sort of uh, unpatriotic and unbolshevik and uh, their works were allowed to slide out of existence. Uh, the two women never met, even though they overlapped in time, they never met uh, in real life. But here it's posited a meeting between the two. One of the women is, uh, was, you know, before the, 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 the Soviet, uh, the Bolshevik revolution, she was a Bolshevik, which alienated many of her peers particularly in the writing sphere. They didn't like her radicalism. She was also a radical feminist. Um, and of course, when the, you know, she, uh, that also meant she had uh, the Tsarist regime, didn't like her. So she had lots of enemies. And when the Bolsheviks came to power, um, you know, that seemed to be her time. But of course, it wasn't. The other writer was writing about the Armenian genocide by uh, Turkey which meant that her enemies were the Turks, and the Young Turks in particular. So they're both sort of, again, slightly under state of siege. 
interestingly, none of them really spent that much time in Armenia, and they spent a lot of time apart from their, their families. The first one, because of her revolutionary zeal, she was, you know, attending uh, meetings, she was giving education to, to other would-be revolutionary women. Um, whereas the other one, uh, she spent a lot of time in Paris just writing. She found it much more conducive to be away from everybody and to be in Paris in order to write. Um, so those are the two historical women, and this book ostensibly is to sort of reinstate them as notable Armenian writers and as radical feminist writers for their time. Then there's two women in the modern age who are charged with exactly that, of, of, of bringing these women back to life. And they meet because one is interested in the first writer and the other is interested in the second writer. And they find they have this sort of shared... Uh, interests and they come together to to plot how they're going to do it and while uh, they do this obviously Armenia is now an independent country and they welcome that and they welcome the development and the modernization of Armenia but when they go looking for the house or the apartment of one of the 19th century writers uh, in Yerevan the capital of course it's hard to find because Yerevan itself has changed so much, it's modernised. So on the one hand they welcome the modernisation that it might finally come into the 21st century. But on the other hand, what does it mean for their traditions, of their history, for preserving of all of that? Which I thought was an interesting sort of way of, of sort of framing that sort of age-old dilemma through the architecture. Um, there are two interrogators. Uh, of uh, the second writer who was uh, imprisoned in the gulags where she finally died. Uh, in here they're imagined as one is um, a fan of the writer and, and although he's interrogating her for Bolshevik purposes he's really also just trying to sort of be a fanboy and, and be near his heroine. The other interrogator is a writer on the side and he comes to the conclusion that if, if this writer perishes and if other writers that they're going to come to uh, uh, torture also perish, that increases his chances of getting uh, published himself because, uh, you know, last man standing kind of argument. So there's a lot of of, of intricate stuff and, you know, you, it, you're not told who's speaking at any one time and it will jump from character to character, writer to writer, time period to time period. But that doesn't matter. That really doesn't matter. I mean, partly... It's all of a piece in terms of, you know, the aims of the two sets of women writers of the two different times are not dissimilar. Um, so they can echo and reverberate with one another. But also, I think you could just bask in, in the creativity and the experimentalism of this book. Um, it was just an absolute joy to behold. And I'm just going to read one. At two in the morning, I was woken up by the ringing of a telephone. It was a dream. Or something like a dream. It was her. She'd left a message. I've got to erase it from the memory. Martha asks Anton, what would you like from this life? Anton answers, to be with you forever. Martha continues, and I'd like to be understood. Historians always distort reality, impoverish our history with lies. But in order to understand that, it's necessary to devote yourself to life. Understand it's in a structure see it from all sides through everyone's eyes and to share your own with them. Sometimes, reader, the typist writer, which is why she refers to one of the modern women, who owns this material, is it, is it, you know, when you're trying to revive an ancient writer, but you have to make it palatable to a modern audience, is it plagiarism? <laughs> That's a brilliant concept. Um, so she just refers to her as a typist writer. Sometimes, reader, the typist writer forgets to put quotation marks around cited words or sentences. Does that mean she steals others' words? Which is worse, to let the living words of the poet die in damp boxes, in dark, treacherous rooms, or to sow them like seeds, mixed with another's words, to revive them and let them bloom in untitled fields? Besides, quotation marks privatise words and make them someone else's property. The words belong neither to the typist writer nor to you, reader. They simply unite our past, present and future. So, wonderful stuff. Uh, five stars, thoroughly enjoyable reading experience. You don't need to be up on Armenian history, as I'm not. Um, as a work of literature, posing questions about the nature of literature, the nature of fiction, the nature of translation, 
the nature of ownership, the nature of language and colonisation. It's all in there. It's sublime. In the, again, it's not preaching at you. It's just throwing all these interrogations about the material itself at you. Five stars. And on to Headshot by Rita Bullwinkle. So this is a story about eight girls, teenage girls on the cusp of adulthood who have made it to the finals of a, uh, an under-18 uh, female boxing competition in Reno, Nevada. And basically it's taking you inside the heads of all eight, um, what got them there, why they took up boxing, uh, what they, how they sort of tell themselves and what, the, what sort of bargains they make with themselves in order to win, what it means for them to be a winner, how they steal themselves to be a winner, and it projects forwards into their their adult lives uh, beyond this competition because none of them continue a career in boxing. So this is all very much about the cusp of um, sort of female teenage years moving into adulthood. And it's it's very simple, but it's very well done. I will say that there are some images about the nature of fighting and landing hits that don't land, like a boxer who, fly, who throws a flurry of punches and not all of them land, but that, that doesn't detract from the book. It's very clever, but yet very simple, as I say, taking you into the, into the minds of these girls during and after the fights. Um, as I say, you know, what made them want to be boxers, what it means to win, how they drive themselves into because only one can win, seven of them are going to lose. And what does not winning mean to them? How does that break down after their defeat? Just very easy, but very satisfying book. Five stars. And on to the Plotinus, or the Plotinus. I first saw this on Chris Veer's uh, channel, um, Leaf by Leaf, and I'll leave a link to his review. This is my first Ricky to Cornet uh, experience. Um, so... The Earth has been conquered by a race of robots who are called the Plotinus or the Plotinus, and they have set up um, a sort of dicto dictatorial regime of rules that must be followed, and our heroine uh, breaks the rule. Um, it's not easy to see quite why walking out of the house with a talking with a tally, what she calls a tally stick, but that is an infraction of the rules. She's arrested and thrown into her prison, which is actually a closet, a dark closet. Um, the only light that comes in is when the sun is, is on its rounds and is lined up with a metal grill, uh, which is there to allow her to breathe, for air to enter it. But, you know, at one point during every day, she's, uh, light is admitted through there as well. And the Plotinus robots, um, they stalk the corridors, they are the overall jailers, but there are also human um, administrators or wardens, I guess, who bring their food, which is random times and what the food is very random. But one of the male um, wardens is charmed by her and uh, sneaks gifts into her to lift the, the unbearable nature of, of being stuck in a closet. But they also talk and chat. So I hadn't heard of Plotinus. Um, he was an ancient philosopher who had a sort of tripartite um, worldview of the divine, which one could never know or approach, then the human level of sensation and perception, and then a cosmic one by which all of the human uh, stuff is joined up. And of course, that cosmos has been created by the divine. So it's a very much a sort of three uh, stage world building. And that, and that comes through really um, through the conversation she has in here because one of the things that happens is one day a hornet comes through the grill and stings her. Um, but she, um, you know, it's such a sort of unique happening that she uh, basically sort of befriends the hornet, sort of tames it, uh, and gradually the hornet brings its mates round into here and the hornets start constructing a hive, if that's what hornets' um, nests are called, I don't actually know. Um, and she sees the structure on it, how, how sort of individual cell-like it is, for each hornet has a, a roost, and yet it is all part of a greater whole, which comes back to the Plotinus cosmic, 
cosmic sort of scale linking all the individual perceptions, which is very much how this book operates. It's fine. I didn't find it startling. The unexplained bits such as, you know, what the rules were, how the Plotinuses were so powerful, able to overcome it, none of that was in there. So I just felt, you know, it is a very short book. It's part of the Coffeehouse Press uh, novellas. So it doesn't have the time to to sort of, you know, explain all this stuff. But I felt slightly uh, left up in the air on, on those things. Four stars. And finally, uh, Jason Reynolds, Long Way Down. So this is a novel told, told in verse, and it opens with a ghetto killing in a playground. Uh, a man is shot, uh, and his bright younger brother is there. And uh, after the sort, of, the sort of shock and the grief of the mother and, and this younger brother, they're back at home that evening, and the brother resolves he's going to take uh, vengeance. That He figures he knows who shot his brother. He knows his brother has a gun secreted away in their shared bedroom. So the next morning, he takes the gun, and he's going down in the elevator in the, in the block of flats that he lives in to go and pursue this guy. And at each uh, floor, the elevator door opens and another person uh, enters the lift. And these are all people from his life who are all dead. So his father, uh, an uncle, um, a young girl from uh, his school who died at age eight, who was just caught in the crossfire of, of sort of gangbanging. Um, and each of them are sort of relating to him because there are these three rules uh, in the ghetto uh, after a shooting. The first is don't snitch. Sorry, the first is don't cry. The second is don't snitch. The third is take revenge, do it yourself, don't trust the authorities. So it's a debate very much on this cycle of violence that, that you know, persists in these type of communities, which mean that more people die it's always senseless, there's no end to it. It's a sort of escalation of, of death through strategy. And each of these ghosts sort of enhances, enhances it. And it's very simple language, it's very well done. Again, I guess the ending, but I'm not sure that takes away from the book. Again, quite satisfying, very self-contained, both the nature of its simplistic verse, but also the story that it's telling and the message of we have to break this cycle of violence. And as um, Reynolds says in the back of the book, here's what I know. I know there are a lot, a lot of young people who hate reading. I know that many of these book haters are boys. I know that many of these book hating boys don't actually hate books. They hate boredom. So here's what I plan to do. Not write boring books. And it certainly isn't. Um, you know, it's 360 pages long, but because it's written in verse, it crackles along. I mean, I finished this in just over an hour. I don't think I've ever read a 360 page book in an hour before. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm not necessarily the intended audience. I wonder his his plea to get book hating boys to read it. I wonder how successful that is. Um, I can see exactly why he's done what he's done but I still think it's a bit of a forlorn hope because there's a step between the finished product of this book, which is very accessible to his target audience, but how do you make the target audience aware that this book exists? I, enough, you know, They don't know that it's a book for them unless they're going to pick it up and start reading. How do you make them do that if they have no compunction and have shown no compunction to do that in the first place? But anyway, uh, for me, who's not his target audience, I enjoyed it. Four stars. And there you have it. Uh, that's been my last couple of weeks reading. I don't know what I'm going to read next, um, but a really, really good week. And, you know, I'm reasonably certain that um, The Night Alphabet and a book untitled are going to be in with a very strong chance of making my uh, books of the year, my top ten. Um, they were just so, so pleasing. And it's interesting that even though I gave five stars to Headshot, I really enjoyed it. It's not going to get in my top ten. It's a really good five-star read, but it's not going to get in my top ten. OK, uh, till next time. Thanks very much.